And thank you for coming out on a, a beautiful spring evening, although maybe we should have done this Tuesday when it snowed. Uh, we discover, uh, Angela and I have been discovering, there's a challenge generating an, is that on? Am I getting this in stereo? Okay. There's a challenge whenever you talk about sports. If you put the word sports in any kind of topic, the people who want to come and talk about sports bar trivia are turned off because they think it's going to be intellectual. And the people who would be interested in a serious conversation are turned off because they think it's going to be sports bar trivia. And so we've been trying to figure out, Angela and I, what's the sweet spot? And so forewarned is forearmed. There's a certain element of sports bar trivia in this, but this is mostly, uh, I won't use the word intellectual, but this is mostly a serious attempt uh, to try to understand the phenomena of sports in American culture and to a certain extent in global culture. And that is, you might think, ancient. You might think that has always been true. And well, of course, sports has always been true. And it was actually a key part of many prehistoric and ancient religions. The way sports has evolved over the last 150 years is in fact a creation of the industrial world. Uh, the notion of organized professional sports and team sports, as the people in this room would think of it, that's actually a relatively recent phenomena, a phenomena that really took root in the middle of the 19th century, both in the United States and in Europe. And it has exploded and become, I think, almost hiding in plain sight, one of the defining characteristics of American culture. And what I've been trying to do with this series is to understand that. And that song you heard earlier, Center Field, uh, by John Fogarty, most people think is the best baseball song. I certainly don't know if it's the best baseball song. It might be the most popular. But I wanted you to hear, and I can't make it play again without it screwing up the whole uh, sequencing, is about the third line in is there's a brown-eyed, handsome man rounding third. And later in the program, we're going to find out where that came from and why John Fogarty put that at the beginning of Center Field. So, oh, we're going to hear John Fogarty. Oh, okay. That actually line comes from a very famous song by a very famous American rock star that was an essential part of the 1950s civil rights movement. And I'll let, I'm not going to tell you who until we get to that part of the program. But in any event, why sports in America? I talked a little bit just a couple of minutes ago about why sports in America. I've been working uh, on a larger project that I think in a slide or two we'll see on what I call the American story. And as Angela said, I do a program on WQLN, which is now on NPR, and on all the major podcast sites called The American Tapestry, in which I've been trying to figure out what's the story of America. This is an outgrowth of that. There have been a couple of outgrowths of that. Uh, that whole project began with America in 1968. Then it turned into The American Tapestry, which was a series. Then a series on American holidays. This is a series on American sports or sports in American culture. Uh, and then tied into this might be the next one that I would do would be on celebrity and entertainment and popular music in American culture. But sports is a big deal in America. And those of you who were here a month or so ago, those are three slides. I'm not going to go over it. And Angela touched on it. Sports is a major big deal in American culture. It's the seventh most expensive holiday. Super Bowl has become the preeminent secular holiday. Uh, perhaps the only secular holiday that challenges it is the 4th of July. And it is seventh in consumer spending. And obviously, Christmas and Thanksgiving uh, dwarf or swamp everything. Uh, the top 10 TV shows of all time, not by quality, but by audience size. Nine of them are Super Bowls. 
The only one that's not a Super Bowl is the final episode of MASH. Uh, intercollegiate sports. Uh, this is just the athletic department budgets. As Angela said, I had the honor to serve as the president of two universities. Only one of them had a bigger budget than Penn State's athletic department. St. Bonaventure's budget's bigger than Penn State's athletic department, but not by a lot. By only 125 million, only by about 40 or 50 million. Um, so it's a big deal. Sports are a huge deal in American culture. But like I said, almost hiding in plain sight the significance of it. And when you try to talk about it seriously, people interested in sports, they, kind of, they don't want to talk about it. And people who like to think about things seriously, when you talk about sports, they think you're talking about trivia, and you're not. It is a major part of American culture. So in any event, this is the Americans in their game series. We did, back in March, the introduction to it and laid down some things. Uh, and this mimics, by the way, the American Tapestry Project, in which I say the, the four essential threads of the American story are freedom story, freedom's fault lines, all the times we didn't live up to our uh, glittering ideals, particularly race and ethnicity and gender. Freedom, the immigrant's tale, everyone in this room, you've heard me say this before, those of you who have been at other talks, everyone in this room is descended, unless you happen to be an indigenous person descended from a, a First Nations group, everyone in this room is descended from an immigrant. Some sooner, some later, some willing, some unwilling, but everybody came from somewhere else. That's what America's all about. So tonight, we're going to look at that second thread, Freedom's Fault Lines, Tales of Race and Ethnicity, and how sports is a lens into that experience. Uh, in May, we will look at Tales of Gender and Women's Rights, and how sports is a lens into that experience. We, Angela and I haven't figured out when, but eventually we'll talk, it has to be sometime, because I'm doing all of this in Chautauqua in the summer, the whole series. Uh, the Immigrant's Tale, Outsiders Seeking Inclusion, uh, sports has been a major, maybe it and show business are the two major routes into American society that immigrants have always used. Uh, most of the American songbook, the great pop tunes of the 20th century, were written by Jewish artists. Most of the great American secular Christmas carols were written by Jewish artists because Jewish artists dominated Tin Pan Alley, because in the early 20th century, that was one place they didn't run into discrimination, and they gravitated to it. And then lastly, we'll try to tie it all together. So tonight, Freedom's Fault Lines, Tales of Race and Ethnicity. So that's tonight's program. Before we get to that, however, I will try to be done in enough time to have some questions, because we had some really good questions last time. I want to address two questions that came up in the March session, uh, one of which, uh, uh, well, Roy pointed out to me that I never really defined games and sports. What really are you talking about? And then Howard and I had an interesting exchange on sports and religion, because one of the sub-theses that I'm working on in this series is Sports is gradually, maybe not so gradually, replaced religion as the primary spiritual component of American culture. When I talk about games and sports, we could spend a lot of time, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but to just clarify and answer Roy's question, what do you mean by the word games? Well, it's a physical or mental competition. It's any activity undertaken as a contest. The word game has a lot of other connotations that aren't directly relevant. A field of gainful activity like the newspaper game or a procedure, a tactic, a shady scheme, an animal you're hunting, or a top, an object of vertical excuse, fair game. But I'm using it in the tooth in bold, and I'll come back to that. Sports is almost self-defining. Any activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another. But it also has other meanings, such as to be a good sport means you're a person who plays fair. To be sporting is a person who is energetic. But to answer Roy's question, in this context, I'm using those two words in this series to mean, obviously, a physical or mental condition, competition 
conducted according to some rules. An activity involving physical exertion or skill, and here's where it gets important, in which individuals or team compete or play. The word play is important here. Against others for entertainment. Now, why is the word play important? Well, back in March, I pointed out that most of our attitudes towards sport are derived from the conflict between the Puritans and congregation, the Congregationalists in Puritan New England and the Anglicans, the Cavaliers in Virginia. The Puritans look down upon sports as frivolous, irresponsible, meaningless activity and did everything they could to suppress it. The Cavaliers in Virginia took a very different attitude. They were sporting. They hunted, they fished, they believed in competition, and we're going to hear in a moment, a little bit later today, and horse racing was their passion, if not their obsession. We could get back into, Roy's more versed in this than me, could give you a talk on the English Civil War, that's not important, but attitudes out of the English Civil War define how we think about sports to this day. We have obviously, in our behavior, long ago left the Puritan attitude behind. But in our thinking about what we're doing, we're still in some ways puritanical. We spend an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of wealth on sports and games that we think are frivolous. So what are we telling ourselves? Uh, and we sometimes feel guilty about it. But more importantly, I'm using sports, it's gonna sound kind of like a professor for a minute, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> We're gonna examine the socio-cultural importance of American games and sports as revealed in the history of intercollegiate and professional sports and what they tell us about the American story. What can you learn about the American story and what Americans think about themselves and how we have lived for the last 2023, 300 years ago, 1723, how we have lived for the last 350 years on the North American landmass. And sports are a powerful lens into how that's done. So that's what this is all about. The other thing that came up last month, Howard and I had an interesting exchange about sports and religion. Randall Balmer wrote an interesting book called Passion Plays in which he makes the argument that sports has become the new American religion. I don't think he's entirely wrong. I'm not sure how far I would follow him in terms of how right he is. But one of the things I got thinking about Howard is, and I'm going to betray my Jesuit background. Uh, in scholastic philosophy, they would talk about the substantive issue and then the accidental properties. So setting aside the substantive issue of religion for a moment and just looking at the accidental properties, sports and religion both have a foundational agreement. There is a statement of mission or a core statement of belief, as, for example, the objectives of the game of baseball. Not the rules of baseball, the objectives of the game, what it is, which is not completely unlike, I'll use the one I would assume is most familiar to this audience, but every other religion has something similar to it, the Nicene Creed, which is a statement of faith. They have rules and sacred texts. I happen just to have chosen the baseball rules, but also the five books of Moses, but most importantly in the five books of Moses, Numbers and Leviticus, which are explicitly, I mean very detailed rules about how you live. They have sacred spaces that they share in common. This is, of course, the great cathedral in Chartres. This is the entrance to the Ohio State University football stadium. They have ritual. For example, if you've ever watched professional European soccer, not American soccer so much, the players enter the field in a very formalized and ritualized fashion. Each team side by side, usually accompanied by a child, the two captains carry a ball and they give the two balls to the referee. They meet at the center of the field and give the two balls to the referee and then they form a line. The referee reads them the rules, then depending on what was going on, they may or may not play the national anthem. 
So that's not so different. They have believers. That's a basketball arena, and that is a revival. And they have languages and shared images that are iconic. And I use the word iconic intentionally. That one's everyone's familiar with. This is in the Pittsburgh International Airport. There is a statue of Franco Harris catching the Immaculate Reception. And this gentleman is paying homage. So in their accidental properties, and that is actually real. If you go to the Pittsburgh airport, you will see it there. And that'll tell you something about America, because what's the other statue? Legendary person who had uh, presence in southwestern Pennsylvania. George Washington as a young man. So Frank O'Harris, and no disrespect to anybody, but that's telling you something. I mean, you watch. I'm a behaviorist in some ways. I watch what, I don't listen a lot to what people say, I watch what they do. And, I just, and so talking about sports and the way I'm going to talk about sports is watching what people do, not what they say. Howard, I thought about this, and I'll, I did this because you and I can go out and have a coffee someday. Howard said to me he didn't think there was transcendence in sports, and I think he might be right. And I'm not going to turn this into a theology class. But there's a couple of ways to approach the notions of the divine. It's called the cataphatic and the apophatic. Cataphatic tells you what the God or the ineffable is. Apophatic tells you what God is by telling you what God or the ineffable is not. Uh, all religions have a code of conduct. If it's secular, it's ethics. If you say it's enforced by whatever, it's a more. The thing, though, there that's interesting to me is the question you brought up, Howard, of transcendence. And you said to me that sports, there's no transcendence. And I've been thinking a lot about that. I know some of the folks in the I know at least a couple of the people I'm looking at at the moment were athletes. There is such a thing known as being in the zone. There is such a thing known as an endor we now know it's an endorphin high, but I know from being a runner, I know from other experiences, it actually also happens to me when I'm doing scholarship. As my wife Judy will tell you, I can just lose all track of time. I can be working, not get up and move, and it's three or four hours later. And athletes are like that, particularly when they're at their highest, most intense level of competition. It's almost an out-of-body experience. Is it sustainable? Well, that's part of the problem. And I would say, if most people in what we would, without turning this into a theology class, without most people with whatever they think about religion, it's not sustainable. You have to come back and do it again by repeated practice. Now, there are some holy people, if we want to call them that, who transcend it and kind of stay in that status, but they're very rare. <laughs> I mean, very rare. So Balmer's notion is not inconsequential. Anyways, that's his book, Passion Plays. I agree with him in three ways. Sports provides a sanctuary in our culture. It's a place of refuge. That's something religion always did. It's a place where people go Literally a physical place. They go to an arena or a field, but it's also a mental place where they go to remove themselves from the stress of life. It's also, it provides moral clarity. Because generally speaking, you no, know, there are rules. If you break the rules, you are punished, you are fouled. And as a generally speaking, the virtuous, the good win. Generally speaking, not always. And it has a tremendous sense of community. So religion provides sanctuary, moral clarity, and a sense of community. But I highlighted this because I agree with Balmer. He thinks that in our culture, and, he's, and please don't confuse the message with the messenger here. I'm not necessarily saying this is a good thing. I'm saying this is a thing, and I'm trying to understand it. And I think that's what Balmer's trying to do. That in our culture, in our time, Sports has replaced religion as the place where the majority of the people go for sanctuary, where they go for moral clarity, and where they go for community. 
suggesting the fundamental lure of community, once satisfied by religious affiliation, has migrated to a secular venue, the stadium, he says sports radio, talk radio, or TV talk radio. I did a non-scientific calculation this morning, thinking about today's program. I just went to the channel guide on cable. At any hour of the day or night on cable television, you can find a program where people are talking about sports. At certain hours of the day, there's a half a dozen to 10 of them running simultaneously. There's one or two religious channels. Something is afoot. This week was the 10th anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombers. That was 10 years ago this week. When the community of Boston was finally permitted, because remember there was that long siege, there was the search for the one terrorist. When the community of Boston was finally permitted to come together again in public, they didn't go to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. They may or may not have gone to the South Church. And I'm sure every church, some churches, had a service. They didn't even go to Boston Common, where Boston went the day they were allowed to come together again was to Fenway Park to see the Boston, but more importantly, to hear Neil Diamond sing Sweet Caroline, because in Boston, in the seventh inning stretch, they sing Sweet Caroline and have done that since the 1970s. That's where Boston went. What an honor it is for me to be here today. I bring love from the whole country. So I don't, don't confuse the message with the messenger, but something is going on. And the whole point of this series is that something involves sports, something that Americans are obsessed with, but somehow don't take seriously. And I think it deserves to be taken seriously. Now, as we go through this program, one of the things is, and I, I, I struggled with whether I had organized this chronologically or thematically, and obviously I've opted for thematically, but that also assumes that, a lot, that you would know a lot about what's going on in the background. And so every now and then I've got to pause and explain about major cultural things. And this is directly related to it. In the 19th century, there was a phenomenon known as muscular Christianity. And that was true, that actually began in England but it came to the United States. And it was because the early 19th century was a period of enormous social dislocation, of enormous social change, of enormous uncertainty about roles and social class and the roles of men and women and roles of various ethnicities. And what drove that in America was three things. One, we were a new country. We had just fought a revolution. We had to make Americans. 
because we were just 13 you know, colonies, uh, which had, to a certain extent, uh, individual identities. Uh, actually, the identities were more regional, although a Virginian, might, an 18th century Virginian, might take very great exception to what I just said. Um, and you had to create another country, but you also had simultaneously two other things happening. You had the rise of, the industri of industrialism, and you had the rise of market capitalism. And one of the things that happened is the transformation of the country from home-based handicraft industries, in which most economic activity, both manufacturing and sh commercial shopping, took place out of homes. Most shops were run by people who owned a home. There was no such thing as a Target, much less a Walmart. All the shops were small, and it was all home-based. Suddenly, the manufacturing occurred in factories, and people left home and went to them. And what was their roles? And suddenly, the role of women had to change, because women were a major part of the handicraft in the world, and the major part of the commercial world, running the shops. And now all of that was gone. And so one of the things that happened is, we'll have to talk a little bit, and I'm going to talk tonight about muscular Christianity. Uh, next month, I'll talk about the cult of true womanhood and the cult of domesticity. But the nature of the roles of men and women changed. The cult of true womanhood and the cult of domesticity, since woman's role as a producer in the handicraft world, and also because people were no longer living on farms and moving to cities, and was no longer the keeper, the woman's role had to change. And we'll discover next, I don't want to get too into this, I don't want to eat up the time because it's next month. The role of woman changed. The woman became the keeper of the hearth. She was defined as man's moral superior. But there were four rules that governed how her behavior was. Piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. That is entirely what the women's movement of the 20th century was a reaction against. And the power of that notion is such today that there are people who still cling to it. We'll talk about that next month. Muscular Christianity was aimed at men who had left home, they'd now gone to work in the factory, now working in offices. And there was this fear that men would wander off without the controlling constraints of a mother or wife. So their, their, their personal morality would be threatened. And there was also the fear that they would become weak because they're now working in, a lot of them were working in offices and clerks in ways they didn't. And I'm not making this up. This is, uh, and so, in England, there became the notion of muscular Christianity, and I'm not going to get into the theology of uh, the broad street reform, the broad church reforms in the Anglican church, etc., and Matthew Arnold at rugby school, but there became the notion that men had to become physically powerful, men had to reassert themselves in order to be able to be uh, advocates, proper advocates for their faith and moral values. And all of that crystallized around the famous books Tom Brown's school days. And the snapshot version of it would be the wars of England were won on the playing fields of Eton. That you would teach the men how to be disciplined, physically strong, and courageous. That comes to America. It's a little louder than I expect it to be. That comes to America through the YMCA movement, because, of course, the YMCA movement began in England with Sir George Williams. Uh, Thomas Sullivan, a retired sea captain, brought it to America when he realized that seamen and merchant seamen, etc., when they came into different towns and young boys coming into the cities where the fact jobs and factories had no place to live, and where they were living were places of ill repute. And so the YMCA movement was to provide them with two things a safe, morally correct home, and physical conditioning, because they were worried about them. This is Anthony Bowen. He founded the first YMCA for African Americans in Washington in 1853. Think about the date for a minute, 1853. So the YMCA movement, and then that gave rise in American culture to all kinds of church-related athletic venues. Catholics caught on quickly with the CYO. There was the Young Men's Hebrew Association. That then comes down to the present, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Athletes in Action. Those two are related. Then in the late 20th century, uh, 
with males, particularly, once again, under social, under the lure of social enticements, abandoning women, abusive, et cetera, et cetera. There was a group created, I think actually it was the football coach, interestingly enough. It was not founded by a preacher. It was the football coach, Bill McCartney at the University of Colorado, who started Promise Keepers, that you would teach men how to behave, that they would learn to keep their promises. They would learn to respect women. They would learn to be self-disciplined. And we have, to this day, cultural fights. There's a recent Supreme Court decision about whether or not a coach can, po can compel students uh, to pray. So that's the cultural background. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change What I want to talk about now for the next 20 or so minutes, then have some Q&A. Knowing me, it will probably be longer than 20 minutes. But is sports, freedom's fault lines, tales of race and ethnicity. The first group I want to talk about is not simply going to be African. You might think this would be all about African American, the African American experience. That's a big part of it. That's a huge part of it. But there's another part of it that's equally important. We tend to forget that the First Nations people, the indigenous people, are still here. If you spend any time at all in Quebec, you will know that. Where you live, this should not come as a surprise to you because all you have to do is drive to the eastern shore of Lake Chautauqua and wander around the southern interior and you are in the Seneca Nation. And I was, as Angela said, I had the honor to serve as the president of St. Bonaventure. And when you're in the southern tier of western New York, all the way up to Buffalo, you're in Seneca country. And I think in a completely different talk here, I, get, I mentioned once that when I was at St. Bonaventure, you know, you're new. So I go to some community meeting, and I'm trying to figure out who's who. I mean, literally, who's who, what people's names are, but also, more metaphorically, who's who? Who actually gets stuff done? And who do you got to get on your side to get stuff done? And it dawned on me at this one breakfast meeting that the most influential person in there were the two most influential people in the room. One of them was a gentleman on my board, Jim Stitt, who became a good friend. He owns Cutco Cutlery. Now, Obviously, since he owns the biggest business in the southern tier, if Jim wants something done, it probably gets done, but not guaranteed. But I also began to realize the fellow sitting at the end of the table next to Jim, and I don't want to get involved in uh, stereotypes, who is taciturn, didn't talk, coal black hair, in a queue, otherwise dressed in, a, in European R clothes, well, he's the sachem of the Seneca Nation, and he's the guy with the money because the wheel has turned. He owns three casinos, et cetera, et cetera. The wheel has turned. He's the dude, which is really interesting and might be surprising to some people. So I want to talk a little bit about the indigenous Americans and their games. Uh, this is a game called Chunky, which is most of the games were stick and hoop, uh, you throw a hoop and then try to throw a stick through it, or you try to keep a, ho a hoop going. Uh, archery, obviously, horse racing, foot racing. But the game, the game of the Native Americans, and they don't call it lacrosse. The game is lacrosse. They invented it. And in its original versions, it could be played by hundreds, if not thousands of people, over fields a mile long or wide. It is the essential sport in their culture, and it actually has a major place in their religion. The origins of the game of lacrosse, and I'm only going to talk about the Native Americans of the woodlands of the Northeast Woodlands, are the Hoden. I've been trying to make sure I pronounce these correctly. That's Murphy's Law. Be my luck, there'll be somebody here. Uh, a Haudenosaunee, which is what the Iroquois called themselves. Haudenosaunee. Iroquois is a white man's word. 
they recognize the reality of how the world works, so they'll accept Iroquois. But if you're with them, it's Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. The Six Nations, and if you've been in New York, you know, the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. The Tuscarora are originally from the Carolinas. They ran into a lot of <laughs> trouble, and they migrated north in the, 18th and early in the 17th and 18th century and are along the southern tier of New York. The word lacrosse was given to the Native American game by French Jesuit missionaries in the 17th century, and no one knows for sure, but since he kept journals, Jean de Brouff, Jean de Brebeuf, is considered to be the first person to call that. But the Odendega call it, I'll kill this word, I know it, de Hunchagoes, men hit rounded ball. The Mohawk call it de Weladan, little brother of war. The game's origins, Howard, are part of the Haudenosaunee religious creation myth. In their world, two people were living in the metaverse, one of the universes, and they were to be married and to be wedded and to give rise to the Haudenosaunee. But then the woman saw a lacrosse player, and that created a rift in the cosmos that she fell through, that the lacrosse player dove through the hole, captured her, and they landed on Earth and gave rise to the Haudenosaunee. It's an essential part of their creation myth. And in fact, to this day, in the NCAA, the award for the outstanding in Division I, men's and women's lacrosse player, is the Tawatan Award, which is a kind of anglicized version of De, La De Waladon. And they actually, in this instance, got the permission of the Mohawk Nation to use it. And that's the trophy that is given for it. Now, in our culture, there's an interesting thing going on. Lacrosse, in mainstream American culture, is what I call a designer sport. It's become a sport played by white kids in the suburbs. And I say that intentionally. It's a sport played by white kids in the suburbs because they've migrated away from basketball and football, which tend to be dominated, particularly basketball, by African Americans. And we'd have to ask ourselves a little bit about that dynamic. And that's Johns Hopkins. That actually is McDowell against what was Villa Maria. Trying to... That's the University of Maryland's women's teams won a national championship. And actually, Mercyhurst University's men won the Division II national championship in lacrosse in 2012 or 2013. And actually, Pat Cuneo and I, and he's going to talk to some people, are trying to figure it out. If anybody knows the answer, I think the only college or university in northwestern Pennsylvania to ever win a team sport national championship is actually Mercyhurst. Uh, they were national champions in men's lacrosse. They were national champions last year in women's rowing. And way back in the 70s, they were national champions in men's tennis. I don't believe Gannon ever won a team national championship. I don't think Edinburgh did. They might have been wrestling. If anybody knows, I'd like to know, because Pat and I are trying to figure this out and track it out. But what's really important is, and I mentioned earlier, people would tend to think, unless you've been there, you've... You don't really think about Native Americans, but they're still here. The number three ranked men's lacrosse team in the world is the Iroquois Nationals from the Haudenosaunee. And they got into an interesting argument with the American government, and this argument's gone on over the last 20 years. When they would go to world tournaments, they wanted to use their passports because the Seneca Nation is a sovereign nation that has arrived at a treaty that it will exist inside. It's, I'm, I will tell you right now, so rather than make a statement that would be erroneous, because the law gets very complicated on how this works, they carry dual citizenship. They are both citizens of the Seneca Nation and American citizens. In fact, Native Americans weren't granted citizenship until the Immigration Act of 1924, and they didn't want it because they thought it trumped their own. Bad verb. In any event, they are here. And actually, in 2020, 
two, because of a conflict over passports and whether they would be permitted to compete in the world championships, the Irish gave them their place. The Irish national team said, you can have our place. You're one of the two or three best teams in the world. You take our place. You deserve to be here. And we tend to think they're gone. Sports would tell you, there are a lot of things would tell you, sports would tell you they're not gone. As a matter of fact, another lens on American history is in the late 19th, early 20th century, you would call this forced cultural assimilation today. Actually, it was a lieutenant in the Army, Benjamin Pratt, founded the Indian schools. And these Indian schools, the most famous of which was Carlisle, which is in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the one at Haskell in Oklahoma, still in Lawrence, Kansas, excuse me, still exists. The Carlisle Indian School, during the 1890s, 19-aughts, 19-teens, 1920s, over 10,000 Native American indigenous males from various tribes were brought there. And the actual motto was, kill the Indian, save the man. Turn them into white people. I'm not saying that's good or bad. The, the, the idea was right. I mean, there was a spirit actually of generosity there, but also a spirit of incredible cultural condescension. And the most famous school was the Carlisle Indian School. This is Glenn Pop Warner, those of you who know something about football, uh, all the Pop Warner Little Leagues, football Little Leagues. He coached the Carlisle Indian School football team. He also won two national championships at Pitt, then also coached at somewhere else in Temple. The Carlisle Indian School football team was one of the two or three great collegiate football teams of the first 20 years. And there are two epic games that took place in 1905 and in 1912. In 1912, Carlisle played West Point. This is literally Indians and soldiers. This is Dwight D. Eisenhower. He played on the 1915, 1912 West Point team. That's him right there, and this is Omar Bradley, for those of you who are World War II historians. The Indians won 27 to 6. And they then beat him again. Well, the Indians had an advantage because they had him, who was probably, this is another one, the greatest American, I put American for the moment in quotation marks, American athlete who ever lived, and that's Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe is a Sac and Fox Indian uh, from Oklahoma, the Indian Territory. He went first to the Haskell Indian School in Lawrence, Kansas, then to the Carlisle Indian School. As an athlete, in 1912, he won both the decathlon gold medal and the pentathlon gold medal in the 1912 Olympics. He played Major League Baseball from 1913 to 1919. He played professional football from 1915 to 1922. He's generally considered to be the greatest football player of his time. And to this day, the most valuable player trophy in the National Football League is the Jim Thorpe Trophy. Most people would consider him to be, I grew up in Canton, Ohio, and that's a Canton Bulldogs uniform, and that was the first professional football team, and that's because, that's why the Professional Football Hall of Fame is in Canton. He's a minor legend there. I can, my mother worked in the courthouse. She would tell stories of meeting him. He would come in uh, because her boss and he were friends. He ended up, however, succumbing to alcoholism and died impoverished. And his widow sold his body to the town of Mock in East Mock, Pennsylvania, which changed its name to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, and they buried him there in order to be a tourist attraction. In 2012, the Sac and Fox Nation, two of his probably great nephews on behalf of the Sac and Fox Nation, sued to bring his body back 
to the proper tribal lands because in that culture you have to be buried in, in sacred ground. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania's claim because it was a contract. They didn't get into the religion. They just said it was a contract, pretty black and white. And so that is his tomb in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. And he is probably, you know, this is okay. This, I'm going to slide a little bit into sports bar trivia talk. He's probably the greatest athlete that ever lived. Because how many people were Olympic champions, major league baseball players, professional football, the greatest professional football player of his time. And I was talking with someone, he's not here tonight, uh, Ken Brasington and I got talking about it once and people say, well, you know, this, that, and the other thing, modern. I said, no, Ken and I both agreed. You give me him, modern conditioning, modern sports medicine, modern nutrition, modern coaching, I think would be okay. <laughs> Billy Mills is the only American to ever win the 10,000 meters in the Olympics, the 10K. He is an Ogala Lakota. He was born on the Pine Ridge Re Reservation. He's an Ogala Lakota. He was a United States Marine and today runs programs for Native American Indian youth and has built foundations for them and raises money, and that's what he does. He's still alive. Uh, he was actually one of the prime movers in getting the name of the Washington Redskins changed. Because the word redskin, most people don't know, comes from scalping. So a redskin was a scalp, and at the risk of a vulgarity, the most prized scalp was female pubic hair. So to a Native American, particularly the Plains Indians, redskin is an obscenity. And they finally prevailed and got that name changed. And they're still here. The indigenous games, or 2023, will occur. Uh, Pascal University was an Indian school. It's an Indian nations university run by the Bureau of the Inter Department of the Interior. Just this spring in March Madness, uh, these three young women who played for various teams and there is, in fact, uh, two Native American Hall of Fames. One is the American Indian Athletic Hall of Fame at Haskell University, run by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It has a kind of ambivalent re relationship with Native peoples. And there's another one, the North American Indigenous Athletics Hall of Fame. And so sports is a... Where is that? That is purely online. This one's in Lawrence, Kansas. And so sports is a lens into something people might have thought, talk about Native Americans, it's just hist you know, it's, that's just history. They're gone. No, they're not. More typically, people would want to talk about the African American experience. And sports is a profound window or lens into that. We're going to take a closer look at some of these people. Now, I can't possibly, even if I'd done by 815, tell you the history of African Americans, and I'm not going to try, but the very first Kentucky Derby was won by Aristides with Oliver Lewis, an African American jockey aboard. Moses Fleetwood Walker in 1881 was the first African American to play in organized professional sports. The NFL was actually integrated prior to Major League Baseball in 1946. I had the honor of knowing him, of meeting Marion Motley, because he's the greatest football player that ever went to the high school I went to. And I went to a high school, Howard, that takes sports religiously serious. I mean, <laughs> they're demented. I'm not, uh, <laughs> Everybody knows about Larry Robinson. Most people don't know about Larry Doby. We'll talk about him in a moment. The NBA was integrated in 1950 with Earl Lloyd, Chuck Cooper, and Nat Sweetwater Clifton. Althea Gibson was the first African-American female to win a world's championship. She won Wimbledon in 1957. Texas Western University won the NCAA championship and caused quite a... Quite a 
earthquake in big time college basketball because in 1966 it was the first time the entire starting five, all five, not the whole team, just the five starters were African Americans. And in 1968, Arthur Ashe won the US Open, the first time an African American male won the US Open. I said, the first Kentucky Derby ever run was won by an African-American jockey. The Kentucky Derby was founded by Meriwether Lewis Clark II. He is the grandson of William Clark of Lewis and Clark. Matt Wynn turned the Kentucky Derby into a national phenomenon by inventing paramutual betting. And it became a truly national phenomena with radio in the 20s and television in the 50s. But I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the fact that seven of the first eight Kentucky Derbies were won by African-American jockeys, and 15 of the first 23 were won by African-American jockeys. Now, how could that be, you're saying? Remember I said in Anglican Virginia, and actually in colonial, the colonial South, the aristocrats. Remember, the South, the Southern United States was founded essentially by exiled English aristocrats. I'm oversimplifying like crazy. And New, New England and Pennsylvania were founded by middle class, for, in New England, middle class Congregationalists in Pennsylvania by middle class Quakers. The South, however, was founded by, essentially by aristocrats, which is why the University of Virginia's athletic teams to this day, what's their nickname? The Cavaliers. That's ancient. Well, in that culture, the preeminent sport was horse racing, but it was a slave culture. The masters owned the horses, but the trainers and the riders were African Americans. And that goes into the 17th century. And that goes all the way into the 19th century, so that by the time you start organized professional racing like this, the guys who know how to train the horses and the guys who know how to ride them are the descendants of those people. But actually, in 1875, they were probably slaves themselves at one point. Not all of them. Or certainly the children of slaves. So seven of the first eight, Oliver Lewis, Willie Sims, James Perkins, Alonzo Clayton, William Walker, Isaac Murphy, and Jim's, James Wingfield. He's an interesting story. He was the greatest jockey of the era. But when Jim Crow occurs in the 1870s and 1880s, suddenly these people are pushed aside. By the early years of the 20th century, the 19 aughts, they're no longer African American jockeys because they've been pushed aside. Wingfield, who was the greatest jockey of his era, could not stand, would not abide, could not tolerate the culture. He did what a lot of African Americans did in the who had who had the opportunity. I mean, remember, he's a highly successful jockey, so he had some getaway power. He, like the great jazz saxophonist, Sidney Bechet, like the great dancer, Josephine Baker, and like any others who had some ability to go, they went to Paris. They went to France. And he was the great jockey of his time in France. But he was an American. He came back and lived the rest of his life in Kentucky, because after a while, he's not French. So, you know, all of these ideas of go back, where would you go back to? I have no idea where I'd go back to. This is where I'm from. So his story is a very interesting story, as is, I'm sure most people know this story or know the broad outlines of Jack Johnson, the Galveston giant. Jack Johnson set off a major revolution uh, he was the great heavyweight boxer of the 1890s. But he was the black African, they didn't use the phrase African American, he was the black heavyweight champion of the world. But then on Boxing Day in 19, oh, I want to get the right date, 1908. On Boxing Day 1908 in Sydney, Australia, because you couldn't have had this fight in the United States at that time, he defeated Tommy Burns, a white man. A black man defeated a white man. 
That set off repercussions. So that Jack London, the great writer, Jack London, who was a white supremacist, Jack London and others began a campaign to find a great white hope who could defeat Jack Johnson. Johnson got in trouble because he didn't apologize for being who he is. For one thing, he was a big man. He could not hide. I mean, he was just a bit, he walked into a room. He's a big man. Two, uh, he had an affinity for white women. He was married three times, all three times to white women. And he didn't apologize for his behavior. So he became an object of hatred. And so Jack London and others started, started a search for the great white hope to find someone who could beat Jack Johnson. Tex Rickard, who was the great promoter of the era, finally convinced, I've got to make sure I get the names right, Jess Willard to come out of retirement. Willard had been the great champion. So he got Jess Willard to fight Jack Johnson on July 4th, 1910 in Reno, Nevada. Willard didn't really want to do it, but he needed the money. And the guys who were actually boxers in the fight, they knew how good Jack Johnson was. But Willard did it for the money, and Johnson beat him. That set off race riots. 20 people died because of the blasphemy that he got beat. Afterwards, the people who knew stuff, Willard himself, said he's the better man, he's the better fighter. That, but that was irrelevant. Johnson then, because I said he was not a shrinking violet, he got in trouble in 1913 and was convicted of the Mann Act. Now the Mann Act was an anti-white slavery, anti-trafficking, to use 21st century language, law, that you could not take a woman across state lines for quote unquote immoral purposes. And the law probably had some legitimacy to it at, at, at its basic core, but it got used in Johnson's case. He was arrested for taking a woman named Lucille Cameron, who happened to be his second wife, across state lines, allegedly for immoral purposes, and he was convicted of violating the Mann Act. And what did Jack Johnson do? He did what James Wingfield did, he did what Sidney Bechet did, he had money, he had the ability to move, he went to Paris. And he lived in Paris for seven years and was the European champion. But, much like Wingfield, he was an American. He didn't want to live in Paris. He, felt, he thought, okay, so anyways, they arranged a fight in 1915 at the Oriental Racetrack in Havana for him to fight uh, I've got to make sure my name's here. To fight Willard again. And this time Johnson threw the fight. Because he thought if he lost, they would forget the man stuff. They didn't. And he spent a year in prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, came out and then spent the rest of his life. And he died in 1946. The last fight he ever fought was in 1945 to raise money for war bonds. I'm sorry, I should have gone to that slide because of the race riots. Jim Crow America. The word Jim, people say, what does that mean? I can't, again, this is like a pausing with muscular Christianity. Uh, the phrase Jim Crow actually comes from a song and dance routine that a white singing in blackface did. Actually, it's Thomas Rice, and he basically invented the minstrel show, and he invented, you could actually say, he invented American popular music because he created a minstrel show singing uh, songs in blackface, one of which was the Jim Crow, which was after a dance uh, that had been common in slave culture. This was a white guy doing this stuff. Jim Crow, because of Thomas Rice's use of that in a demeaning fashion in minstrel shows, Jim Crow became a 19th century phrase of disrespect and contempt for African Americans. Fast forward the tape to 1875, 76, 77, when the presidential election of 77 is thrown to Rutherford B. Hayes and the, the federal government removes its troops 
uh, from the southern states and Reconstruction ends and the black codes are in force, Jim Crow became the shorthand for the laws of segregation and separatism. Jim Crow America then expunged black players. Jackie Robinson was not the first African-American professional baseball player. First African-American professional baseball player was Octavius Cato in Philadelphia in 1869. Probably the second greatest African-American baseball player of the 19th century was Bud Fowler, who was a pitcher. The greatest African-American baseball player of the 19th century was Frank, go on a blank, hold on a minute. Frank Grant, who played for a number of prof professional teams throughout the Midwest. Moses Fleetwood Walker is generally regarded as the, not the first African-American, but the last African-American to play professional baseball before the Gentlemen's Agreement in the late 1880s, early 1880s, banning African-Americans from playing professional sports, professional baseball in particular. That's Moses Fleetwood Walker. And this is William Clarence Matthews. I'm going to talk about these two gentlemen in a moment. Moses Fleetwood Walker was the son of a doctor. He was a great athlete. He played for Oberlin College and the University of Michigan. He then played for the Toledo Blue Stockings until Cap Anson initiated, Cap Anson founded the Chicago White Sox, was one of the founders of the National League, ban, got a gentleman's agreement amongst the owners to ban African Americans from professional sports. And Fleetwood Walker, Fleetwood Walker then was gone from that. He then made his living as best he could. He had a number of scuffles. But by the early, 19th, early 20th century, interestingly enough, he got involved in this newfangled thing called motion pictures, and he owned cinemas in black neighborhoods and black communities, and he actually invented and got patents on a couple of things that operated the projectors and spent the rest of his life uh, running movie theaters. Uh, and he died in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, this gentleman is a fellow that I was fascinated to discover. I talked about him on a podcast a year ago. William Clarence Matthews went to Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Academy. But he was so brilliant academically and gifted athletically that Booker T. Washington used his influence to get him into Phillips Exeter Academy in New England. From Phillips Exeter Academy in New England, he went to Harvard. And he played baseball for Harvard. And he was considered to be the great distinguished collegiate baseball player of the late 19th, early 20th century. In fact, he was so good that in the early 1900s, the owner of the Boston Bean Eaters, which was the name then of the, what became the Boston Braves, who were now the Atlanta Braves after a couple of moves, was going to bring him in and play, you know, play in Boston. But the pressure was such from other owners, he didn't do it. So Matthews couldn't play professional baseball. But he did graduate from Harvard. He then coached, that's him, coaching the Lower Nobles school team. And while he was coaching the Lower Noble School team, he graduated from Boston University Law School, and after that became one of the first assistant district attorneys in the African American assistant district attorneys in the United States. He then became a founder and a major player in the Republican Party in New England and New York. The Republican Party, if you remember, was still then the party of Lincoln. He was a key player in getting Calvin Coolidge elected president. And he was the first African-American assistant attorney general of the United States. He died of a heart attack in 1928 at the age of 54. Most African-American ball players in the late 19th and early 20th century, did, they had to make their living barnstorming. They would organize a town team. This is the Buxton, Iowa Wanderers. Uh, they would organize a team, and then they would go around, and they would play whoever they could get to play them and they would pass the hat or they would sell tickets. And, of course, that was immortalized in a, a movie, which the movie is a comedy. This actually wasn't a comedy in real life. But the movie with uh, Richard Pryor and Billy D. Williams and James Earl Jones, Bing the Longs, Traveling All-Stars, gives you a taste of that culture. What really happened, though, was beginning in the 1890s, 19 aughts, 
There were multiple attempts to create professional baseball leagues, black baseball leagues, national. And that came to fruition in 1920 with the founding of the Negro National League by Rube Foster. Rube Foster was one of the great pitchers of the era, but he was also an entrepreneur and a barman. He founded the Chicago Black Americans. He created the Negro National League. And for most of the 19, he took 5% of the gates to himself. And for most of the 1920s, he produced the Negro National Leagues. But the first Negro National League went out of business and came back as the second Negro National League in the late 20s and early 30s. And it was anchored in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, when Cumberland, no, when Cumberland Posey founded the Homestead Braves and Gus Greenlee founded the Pittsburgh Crawfords, which were the two dominant black teams of that era. And the golden age, the heyday of the Negro professional leagues was the 1920s and the 1930s. Then two things happened, World War II, but also, and here's some teams, the Cleveland Buckeyes, the Chicago American Giants, the Newark, uh, there are the Homestead Grays, the, are the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And I wanted to go, we had a touch here of this in Erie, I wish my friend Fred Rush were here, he knows more about this, he's forgotten more about this than I'll ever know, was the Erie Pontiacs. And if you go down to Bayview Park on the Bayfront, you will see that field and that sign. And the Bayview Pontiacs were somewhere between a barnstorming team, the Erie Pontiacs, somewhere between a barnstorming team and a not quite ever official member of the Negro National Leagues, they began life as the church team for St. James African American Methodist, AMNE, African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Europe. Uh, and they were a dominant team and one of the, if not best, amateur baseball teams in this part of the country. Negro Hall of Famers, I will tell you a personal anecdote. A couple of years ago, when I was in the Coopers, this is in the late 90s, I was in Cooperstown for a meeting of some kind. I think it was financial aid of all things, but whatever. I was in a meeting in Cooperstown, so I went to the Hall of Fame, and as I looked at the pictures, I thought about a third of you guys, not the Hall of Famers themselves, but the team pictures and the other stuff, I said about a third of you guys are here on a pass because there was a whole other group of people. Well, that's all been corrected. Uh, just this year, a Baseball Hall of Fame recognized the Negro Leagues as professional major leagues and counts their statistics. And there are about 40 or 50 of them, that, of those players, now in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But the greatest of them was Josh Gibson, who played for the Homestead Braves. Satchel Paige, I'm sure even non-baseball fans have heard that name. Oscar Charlson, Buck Leonard. Uh, brain cramp. Monty Urban and James Cole Papa Bell. And I don't want to do this gentleman disservice. Smokey Joe Williams. Uh, he was the great pitcher of the era. Papa Joe James Cole, Papa Bell, Satchel Page always told the story about him. He's generally considered to be, if not the greatest shortstop who ever lived, black or white, certainly on the short list. Uh, he was renowned for his speed, and Satchel Page famously said of him, because they were roommates for a while on the road, he was so fast that when he turned the switch off, the light switch off at night, he was in bed before the room got dark. <laughs> The NFL was integrated before Major League Baseball. And the NFL has an interesting history, much like professional baseball. There were African Americans who played professional football, such as Fritz Pollard, who was the quarterback at Brown, uh, won the Rose Bowl. Brown defeated Yale in 1924 or five. He then played for the Akron Pros. The early NFL, by the way, should be of interest to you because it's entirely a Northeast Ohio and Western Pennsylvania phenomenon that then grew out of that. Uh, he played for the Akron Crows. They were Bobby Marshall, Dave Myers, Joe Lillard. They were great players. But in 1933, the NFL owners came together and created their own gentlemen's agreement. There would be no African Americans in professional football. And that held through World War II until the integration of the NFL occurred in 1946. And it happened because of this gentleman, who I have a love-hate relationship with. I, 
I grew up in Canton, Ohio. I went to Canton McKinley High School, which is the number eight or nine winningest high school football team in the country all time. He was, their arch rival was the Maslin Tigers. They are like the second or third winningest team all time. They both are approaching a thousand wins. Think about that. To win a thousand games, you got to win a lot of games and you have to play for a long time. They both go back to the 19th century. Paul Brown was the coach at Maslin. The NFL was integrated in 1946 when Kenny Washington and Woody Strode, who played for UCLA and were teammates of Jackie Robinson, were signed by the Los Angeles Dons of the All-American Conference. Woody Strode, you might actually remember as an actor, because he only played for two years because he could make more money in movies. And he was a, a, an actor. You've seen him. He was never quite the star because in that world, African Americans weren't the star. But you have seen him in dozens of movies. If you look at that image, Paul Brown, however, when he founded the Cleveland Browns, the first thing he did was, Bill Willis had played for him at Ohio State, and I mentioned I went to Canton McKinley High School. Marion Motley is the greatest athlete who ever went to Canton McKinley High School. I actually got to meet him, shared a bus seat with him on the way to the Muhammad Ali Chuck Wepner play. He had played against Brown in high school, and Brown got him to be a pro. So football would be for baseball. One, two, three, I mentioned the, the John Fogarty song. That's Chuck Berry who did the original version, Brown Eyed Handsome Man, which is not a song. That bit at the end is about Jackie Robinson, but the song is actually about discrimination. Most people know the story of Jackie Robinson very well and Branch Rickey. Uh, I'm going to tell you very briefly about Larry Doby, who seemed to have a genius for always being second. Larry Doby was the second African American to play Major League Baseball. He was signed in 1947 by Bill Beck, and he played for the Cleveland Indians his first game on July 5th, 1947 in Chicago, a little less than three months after Jackie Robinson in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm watching the clock, pick up the tempo here a little, and I'll, some of this maybe next uh, month. Uh, Doby also was the second African American to be a manager of a Major League Baseball team. The first was Frank Robinson with the Cleveland Indians in 1975, Doby with the Chicago White Sox. This is an interesting chart. Of course, in 1946, there were none. By the time you get to the late, set in the middle 70s, about 16 to 19% of Major League Baseball players are African Americans. By the time you get to today, it's down to uh, 4 or 5%. And what's happened there is a couple of things. Two of them are basketball and football. But the other is, baseball is not a game you can easily play in the inner city. It requires a big field, for one thing. And also, youth sports teams and programs in the inner cities have collapsed. I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to go into that. That brings us to today. Most of these faces you do know, but I do want to talk about this fellow as I wrap this up. Sam Cunningham, who Paul Bear Bryant famously said, Sam Cunningham did more for integration in the South than Martin Luther King. I don't know that he was intentionally being disrespectful or not. I'm not going to judge that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to use sports as a lens, He's probably right. On September 12, 1970, the University of Southern California came to Birmingham, Alabama with their integrated team and played the all-white University of Alabama team and demolished them. After that, Southern football teams and Southern athletic programs got integrated because they knew if they didn't, it was over. And of course, one of the byproducts of that is the rise of the Southeastern Conference. And I'm looking at the clock. I do want to leave a little couple of moments for questions. The rise of the Southeastern Conference and the demise of the Big Ten, because the Big Ten in its heyday 
Amongst its great athletes were a lot of Southern guys, black guys, who couldn't play for their home state team. So they went north. But just like James Wingfield coming back, Jock Johnson coming back, if I'm a kid in Georgia, this is where I grew up, if I can play for them and I know how to navigate this culture, I'm going to play for them. I'm not going up there. So that changed everything. So I don't know whether Bear Bryant meant it respectfully or disrespectfully. I'm not going to judge him on that. But I'm going to tell him in terms, I'm going to say that in realistic terms, he's not entirely wrong. It changed everything. And that brings us to today, where we still are dealing with. You have people like Roberto Clemente, who's an icon, but LeBron James, back to moral clarity, Howard, who speaks out, and Laura Ingraham tells him to shut up and keep, just shut up and just dribble. And the thing that bedevils me, and I got, shouldn't maybe bring this up at the very end like this, Patrick Mahomes is probably the best quarterback in the world at the moment. He is forever called a black man. His mother is white, and his father, who was a major league baseball player, is black. But in our world, he's a black man. That's not a bad thing. I'm just, it, it tells you something about our world. Next month, Tales of Gender and Women's Rights. Thank you.